Welcome to Haxby Shed and part five of repairing this Elliott 10M Shaper. The sun is out, the clocks have changed, it's nearly warmer and I'm just about over this darned awful cold which I've had for about four weeks which has been draining my energy. My voice still isn't quite right. In this video we're mostly working on the big clutch pulley on this side, getting it ready to fit, but I also start work on adding an extra shaft on this side so that we can turn over the shaper without having to go around the other side and pull the door down and, you know, manually turn over that pulley. And at the end of this video, I'll show you a few bits that Owen sent me. Um, a few wheels to go on my mechanical tachometer. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the video. When I got this Harrison Universal milling machine with a vertical head, I wondered what would be my first job with the head at an angle and how long would it take before I got round to using that and now I know this pulley with its bearings in there goes on that spigot and we know it's really tight on that spigot so I'm trying to think how do I get this pulley onto there now I thought about freezing this but instead I'd prefer to heat this I just put it in the oven for a while but the bearings are full of grease when they're fitted you know won't the grease all run out I don't know wouldn't it be better if there was a grease nipple in here? I could heat it up, get it onto here, then pump it full of grease afterwards. So in fact, I've already drilled the greasing hole in there and I've already tapped it as well, quarter UNF, but I need to make a flat seat. So I'm gonna use this head at an angle, this long cutter. Now, I found this at the Auto Jumble. It was, I think it was three pounds. It still had its jelly on it. It's a 916 and I thought, well, I wonder when's the first time I'll use this long cutter. Chucked it in the box and here we are. So I don't have a quill on this. What we'll need to do is move it in and up, in and up, in and up till I get a big enough seat on here. Slow and steady. Obviously there's only so much I can take off this, that I'll have to do. There's enough clearance there to get my socket on, and a bit more. Grease nipple fitted, clutch cone goes on, and doesn't interfere. The hole comes out not exactly where I wanted, but near enough. If I'd made it shallower, so that the hole came out more here, I wouldn't have got my cutting tool in anyway. It's time to drill the five holes and then thread them to secure this shield disc on this end to protect this end bearing. And I'm using this rig here and I think this base is probably one of the best things I ever made. It's indexed in two rows. So I've got tenths and I've got twenty-fourths and a little spring lever here. So basically mounting this on this chuck, this is an L00, so it will take any of my chucks off face plates. It's just like really good, I think. It has one weakness, and that is it has a little bit of movement there, look, because I've got this spring-loaded pin, and I didn't make an inbuilt clamp. I should have done. However, I will get round that one day, because I'll remove this spring-loaded pin, and I'll have a screw, something that screws, and the peg will go in the hole, and it'll lock it solidly, and then it will be fine. So if you're drilling five holes, you just have to locate one. You can rotate this, in this case, two holes at a time to give me fifths, and just spot all the way around. It's as simple as that. It's a I'm going round with a 7 64th drill, which is the tapping drill for 632 UNC. And I'm going in about 12 millimetres, around about that. I've very carefully tapped all five of these. It's very difficult with such a slender tap, but we got away with it. Well, I've essentially finished fitting these screws. This plate was really quite troublesome. It wanted to wander all over the place, even with two screws in. I think being mild steel and being gummy. Anyway, 
I just need to shorten one or two of these screws, I think. I bought half inch. I would have been fine with three eighths. I was just being over careful as usual. Next, let's drill the pilot for this. 5.2 millimeters or 13 64ths, I think. This is 40 millimeter. I think to clear that snap ring, we need 46. I've just changed this lathe over to the synthetic coolant that I got for the mill. Much better than the soluble oil stuff. Actually this needs opening out to 55, so that's going to be 7.5 millimetres on the dial. So start with a mill. You know I love this lathe. It's not big, but it just does anything that you ask it to do. on this scale anyway. I want to chamfer the back of this disc, but I don't want to be taking it off and turning it round. But I do have a boring bar that cuts the other way. Now I can never remember which is left and which is right, but this is the normal side, what you commonly see, but I managed to pick up one that cuts on the other side. And it's proved to be extremely useful. It was a really lucky find. So the next job is to give this a thorough clean and press the bearings in. Well the bearings are in, so I need to keep that clean now. I'll probably put it in a carrier bag or something just to keep all the rubbish off it. This is next, so this presses onto here. You can see four holes here where this fastens to the machine. But this hole is for an oil gallery. Now this was fitted with red sealer at one point. That's all gone. And what I'm going to do is counterbore this and put an O-ring on that face there. And then I can be sure that the oil is going to come along through and into this bearing and not lost on this face here. I've cut this 1.5 deep. You need a little bit of space for it to squash, if you know what I mean. But it also needs to be not too narrow, otherwise it won't squash properly. Now the question is, do I go a little bit further? That seal is 1.85 millimetres thick, and I've machined the pocket 1.65 millimetres. There's enough additional diameter for it to spread a little bit. And that should be fine. I'll just have to remember to put it in when I bolt this on. Sorry for the croaky voice folks, but I've still got this dreadful cold. I've been basically laid up now for about nine days. This is the first time in nine days I've attempted any video. It's just some sort of cold and it's not on my chest, it's just my head. Um, I'm hoping to get to karate tonight. I haven't been for three weeks. I'm not particularly good at karate, but I do like to go. Uh, anyway, Laurie from Laurie's workshop said to me he'd done some tests to see if he could put a wheel onto here that would allow us to advance this ram without having to go to the other side and pull the pulley cover down. And uh, the test showed that you'd need quite a big wheel on here and it was quite cumbersome. So as an alternative to that, what I plan to do is to add a shaft onto this one here. So this is on the intermediate gear between the drive and the bull wheel. And if I could put a shaft on there, a bit like this one, uh, with a hex on it, then I could use that to advance the shaper ram uh, to do testing before I set the thing going and so on, you know, test the setup. 
So <clears throat> I've had like a plan A and a plan B for this. Um, plan A is already in the bin, but I'll explain what it was. <laughs> uh, plan B is nearer to this. Now these are uh, about 0.8 of an inch. So 20 and a half millimeters, which I think was uh, 13 sixteenths with a half inch square on. Now I don't want to put a half inch square on this little shaft I'm putting in here um, because if I leave on this handle, which is here, right? If, you're, if you leave the handle on here by accident, well, all it's doing is advancing like this a bit at a time. So if you left it on by accident and set the shaper going, it'd just whack you on the back of the leg and it'll give you a bit of a reminder what you've done. But if this handle was on here and spinning around at great speed, you know, it could really do some damage to the machine or, you know, possibly your arm. So I'm going to put a hex on this shaft, not a square, so that I can drive it with a ratchet. And then at least if the machine takes off with this handle still on, um, you know, then it should just click round that ratchet. This was plan A. So I've got loads of these 150 long 16 millimeter by two millimeter threaded bolts. And I thought these would be an ideal extension to the shaft in the machine. Um, but you can see the results a bit variable. I was very careful when I tapped it. I got the tap lined up with the center in the tailstock to hold it true, but still it looks like this. So I machined the end of this test piece. This is just free cutting uh, to square that off. And I put a nut on and when I put the nut on, I get a kind of variable result. Right, well, if I did that three times, I would get three different results, I can tell you. There's too much deviation on that. That ain't going to work. So we have to go to plan B. I should just add, if this had worked, I would have cut this head off here, and then I would have machined this with a 13 millimeter hex. Uh, that would have been machined down a bit here, because the shaft's only one inch diameter, uh, and that goes out to about 27 across there because it's a 24 millimeter AF nut. So I would have just machined a bit off here to relieve it. But anyway, it could have worked, but it doesn't. So plan B involves this piece of 20 millimeter free cutting, I think, but it's more like the shafts that are on the cross slide, on the table cross slide. Uh, and on this, I could machine a 17 millimeter hex, which is, you know, perhaps a more common size in here. But what I would have to do is machine into the, not this, but into the idler shaft, uh, probably remit 16 millimeters, machine this to size, press it in, probably put a screw through, something like that, or a pin or whatever, right? So it's a bit more complex and I wouldn't really easily be able to remove it once I've done it. But, you know, I think plan B is what it has to be. Right. I've shoved this gear, idler gear, through this hole just to hold it out of the way. And here's our shaft. And thanks to John for the idea of nitrile gloves. I mean, the thing is, you know, if you're an apprentice or something, you have a structured learning program. Uh, if you're just a hobbyist, things don't necessarily come in the right order. So, you know, <laughs> nitrile gloves are probably a day one um, instruction, but uh, they weren't like that for me. I'm guessing this is something like EN8 in British Standard Speak. Uh, it's soft enough. If I drill and ream this for 16, it's a little bit less than half the area and that sounds about right to me. So what I'm actually going to do is drill it with a 14, I'm going to bore it out and then I'm going to ream it because they do say, don't they, drill bore ream because if the drill goes off if you just use straight the reamer the reamer goes off as well doesn't it so that's the plan and then there's a question of how deep do I do it well I reckon what do you think 30 that would be enough won't it 30 millimeters deep just under well near enough an inch and a quarter right this is pretty soft stuff just starting with an 11 Opening it out with a 14. I think this hole is looking big enough already. It's just over 14 at the moment. 
So I'm going to ream it with a 9 16 reamer, which is about 14.25 millimeter. This is a solid carbide reamer that I got from DJ. So if you're watching this DJ, thank you very much. That's the first time I've used this. Now I would have preferred it at 15. I haven't got a 15 reamer. Yes, I know I can bore it. Yes, I know I'm overthinking it. This is what I'm doing folks, okay? I reckon that hole's big enough. And besides, when the bar comes onto it, like this, it'll come up on the shoulder anyway. There'll be a shoulder against here. What am I doing? Well, I'm making a special adapter, a special tool. I'm gonna to machine this piece of wood down very slightly. That'll run through that hole. This is one inch diameter. I'll put this in place of that idler shaft in the shaper, push this through. I'll have a drill pushed in at this far end. Uh, and with that, hopefully, I'll be able to drill the hole in the casing to mark where the shaft's gonna come out. That's the 20 millimeter shaft, I mean. It's a bit crazy, but I think it's gonna work. Back end of a three and a half millimeter drill pushed into a three millimeter hole, which you can do in wood. We're ready to try it. That's the complete unit, look. Hey, look, it's gonna work. Right then, here goes. I'm just hoping that that drill won't run off when it hits the back of this casting here, which it could do being a small drill. I'll just have to take it steady, won't I? Ah, oh, well, we've lost the drill off the end. <laughs> but it must be almost through. Well, there's the drill. Let's just hope it all lined up okay. It just jammed at the end there and then spun itself out of the wood. Best I can tell, that drill's coming in and out of that hole without any deflection. I can see through here actually, with a light in there, and it looks like it's just straight, so that's fine as a pilot hole. Owen's channel is called Boots Owen, and he does some serious stuff and some fun stuff. Uh, and I'm just gonna show you a clip here which is one of his fun videos, which is a washing machine bouncing on a trampoline. It's only got 4.9 million views, something that I could only dream of. Anyway, the bits that he sent me fit onto this Smith's tachometer. Now I got this from the Auto Jumble, I think about five pounds, something like that. It's not that accurate. It's probably about 5% slower, if, if I remember. And one of the fittings is just a sort of point you can put on the end, and that goes straight into the end of a spindle or something and it counts the RPM. Well, you probably wouldn't bother with that these days because electronic tachometers are, are better, I would suggest to you. Uh, but what you can do is you can put on a wheel like that and let that run against something that's rotating and you can measure off uh, directly the surface feet per minute or the surface meters per minute. I think you divide the scale by 10, if I remember correctly. So that could be quite useful. We'll give that, give that a go on the lathe. I'll do a quick calculation of, you know, the diameter of, yes, circumference, circumference. Uh, and we'll just see, you know, see what it's like, but it could be quite useful. Anyway, I'll put a link into uh, Owen's channel and uh, you can take a look at that for yourself if you want. We're going to test out that gauge on this piece of bronze tube. It's 41.2 millimeters diameter which gives us a circumference of 129.5 millimetres. So I'm measuring it in millimetres because we think it's a metric wheel. So if I multiply that by RPM, that will give us, you know, by calculation, what the surface metres per minute actually is. We'll put the gauge on, on the lathe and see what it reads.
Well, we got there in the end, took a bit of head scratching to work this out. So this, 41.2 millimeters diameter, circumference is pi d, which is 129.5 millimeters. On the lathe, we saw 1450 RPM times 0.1295 meters. So basically, the surface speed of this was 187 meters per minute. Well, the, using the gauge, it didn't read that at all. It was 1200. So let's work on the suspicion that that was the imperial wheel and not the metric wheel. So to get from 187 meters per minute, multiply by 3.25 to get surface feet per minute, and that's 607 surface feet per minute. And the gauge was reading 1200. Now, I managed to find this set of instructions on eBay, and it says for the imperial wheel, take the reading and divide by two. I mean, trust me, it does say that. So, we know it, uh, so the reading was 1200, divide by two is 600. So, by calculation, the surface feet per minute, 607, and measured by the gauge, 600. So, that's it, thanks very much, Owen. It is the imperial wheel, not the metric wheel. Well, what was supposed to be just a bit of a novelty end clip turned out into something quite big in itself. Anyway, I hope you found that useful. Thanks for watching, and Owen, thanks for the wheels.